Hello everyone. Previous class we discussed about the musculocutaneous nerve injury and axillary nerve injury. Today we'll start with suprascapular nerve injury. Suprascapular nerve arises from the upper trunk and it uh, passes through the inferior lateral area of the trapezius and then it enters the suprascapular notch under the transverse ligament. Then it supplies to supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So its main supply is for supraspinatus muscle and infraspinatus muscle. What are the main causes for suprascapular nerve injury? The fracture of the scapula or clavicle is the most common cause for suprascapular nerve injury. Any traction or any kind of trauma to the scapula or clavicle or directly to the nerve can cause this uh, injury. Some other causes can be extrinsic compression, brachial plexus lesion, shoulder dislocation, overuse that is using your arm overhead or any kind of compression that is uh, ganglionic cyst compression, tumor compression, compression at the transverse scapular ligament, compression at the spinoglenoid notch by any kind of cyst. So these all are some of the main causes for suprascapular nerve injury. What are the clinical presentation of the suprascapular nerve injury? It is usually insidious onset. The pain is dull ache over posterior shoulder. The tenderness on palpation of the triangle between clavicle and scapular spine. Aggravating factor for suprascapular nerve injury is overhead activities and slipping on the affected side. So we know this nerve supplies supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Therefore, the injury of this nerve can cause wasting or atrophy of this muscle or weakness. So if these muscles are weak, then which functions will be altered or uh, which functions will be diminished? Abduction because supraspinatus helps in initial abduction and lateral rotation. Lateral rotation is created by infraspinatus. So these two motions will be affected. Coming to physiotherapy management for this nerve injury, what, what all will be the problems? The problems will be glenohumeral joint stiffness because patient is not able to move to abduction. You can see in the picture here, if you ask the patient to perform abduction, uh, there will be more of superior translation because of the activation of deltoid, which is a translatory muscle for glenohumeral joint, whereas supraspinatus is a rotatory muscle for glenohumeral joint. So the rotatory component will be lost. Therefore, you can see this kind of translation upward because of the activation of deltoid. So the glenohumeral joint will be stiff because of the reduction in range of motion and also tightness of capsule and muscles in long term. For stiffness, we can provide active range of motion and passive range of motion exercises along with mobilization and stretching of the capsules as well as muscles. Muscle shortness also will be seen mostly for adductors because the abduction range will be reduced. Therefore, adduction, adductor muscles will be always in a shortened position. Therefore, adductor muscles stretching is one of the management for suprascapular nerve injury. Muscle weakness and atrophy of supraspinatus and infraspinatus will be seen. Therefore, we will be performing strengthening exercises for supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle. So we know the strengthening protocol. It depends on MMT finding. If MMT grade is 1, then we will be giving muscle stimulation 1 or 0. If MMT grade is 2, it is suspension. If it is 2 plus, it is active assisted range of motion. If it is grade 3, then active range of motion exercises. And if it is grade 3 plus and above, it is progressive resistance exercises so let's check the first demonstration for suspension therapy for external rotator what is the uh, muscle for external rotation it is infraspinatus so infraspinatus if it is uh, weak we 
that is grade 2 then we will be starting with suspension patient will be in sitting position and the forearm will be supported on the sling and then we'll ask the patient to perform external rotation of the glenohumeral joint which we can ask the patient to repeat it 10 times into 3 sets if the strength increases to grade 2 plus then we'll position the patient to uh, prone line position and then we'll, uh, we'll abduct the shoulder to about 90 degree it should be supported underneath by the towel roll which is not shown in this picture and then we'll ask the patient to perform external rotation where the elbow is flexed to 90 degree if patient is not able to perform full range of motion against the gravity that is grade 2 plus so if it is grade 2 plus then we'll ask the patient to initiate movement and the therapist will assist the range to the full range next if patient is able to perform full range of motion against gravity then we'll ask the patient to perform 10 repetitions active range of motion exercises for external rotation to strengthen infraspinatus if it reaches 3 plus that is if patient can take some minimal resistance then we can start with theraband where patient will be in sitting position theraband will be fixed on bilateral arm and then uh, shoulder will be kept in adducted position and we ask the patient to perform external rotation we also can use the weight cuff patient has to be in sideline position so that the gravity acts against the movement or the dumbbells can be used for external rotation so remember repetitions has to be constant 10 repetitions into 3 sets next we move on to the most common nerve injury of upper limb that is radial nerve injury so you can see that radial nerve arises from c5 c6 c7 c8 and t1 it comes from the posterior cord and then uh, it gives branches to the triceps at the level of you can see the proximal part of the humerus around the surgical neck of the humerus it gives branches to the triceps three head of triceps then it uh, moves towards the spiral group then gives branches to the brachioradialis after that it reaches the elbow joint and branches into the superficial sensory branch and the deep motor branch so superficial sensory branch supplies the posterior part of the forearm and the lateral three digits till the proximal interphalangeal joint the deep branch will supply the motor supplies to the extensors of the wrist you can see here in this picture the sensory supply by superficial sensory nerve of radial nerve the posterior compartment of the forearm and the lateral three and a half digits until the proximal interphalangeal joint that is the sensory supply by radial nerve what are the causes for radial nerve injury the common causes at the axial level is aneurysm and the crutch palsy so aneurysm of axillary vessel and the crutch palsy where the crutch will compress the radial nerve or the posterior cord of the brachial plexus at the shoulder area the most common causes are proxim proximal humerus fracture shoulder dislocation at the spiral group it is uh, soft fracture, Saturday night palsy or syringe palsy between spiral group and lateral epicondyle it is fracture soft of humerus supracondylar fracture lateral epicondyle fracture of the humerus or any other penetrating injury cubital valgus deformity also can cause the radial nerve injury between spiral group and the lateral epicondyle at the elbow area it is posterior dislocation of the elbow which is the common cause fracture head of the uh, radius and montezia fractures are also common causes at the elbow area at forearm the fracture of radius and ulna penetrating or any other injuries such as gunshot injuries now coming to the level of lesion of radial nerve injury 
the clinical feature will differ according to the level of injury for radial nerve. You can see here it is divided into high, low, type 1 and low, type 2. So high is above spiral group, low type 1 is between spiral group and lateral epicondyle and low type 2 is below elbow. So you follow this diagram here, if it is high that is above spiral group, it could be anywhere above spiral group, it could be at the brachial plexus region, it could be at the surgical neck region. So if it is around surgical neck area, the injury of the radial nerve, then the supply to the triceps, supply to the brachioradialis, sensory supply as well as deep motor branch will be involved. If it is at the uh, below spiral group or lateral epicondyle, that is if it is around here, then the brachioradialis and uh, sensory branch as well as deep motor branch will be involved. If it is uh, lower type 2 that is below elbow, it could be either deep branch or superficial sensory branch will be involved. Whereas brachioradialis and triceps will be innervated. So the radial nerve would be supplying brachioradialis and triceps above elbow. So therefore it won't be involved. So the level of radial nerve injury is important for us to plan the management or rehabilitation program for radial nerve injury. Low radial nerve injury type 2 can be divided into two types that is radial tunnel syndrome or posterior interosseous syndrome which involves only the motor branch of the radial nerve that is motor deep branch and superficial radial nerve syndrome which involves only the sensory branch that is superficial radial nerve radial tunnel syndrome which is the motor nerve involvement of the radial nerve below elbow you can see the radial tunnel is formed by the posterior surface of the radius bone and the supinator muscle so it gets entrapped inside this tunnel at the level of arcade of fossae which is the area where the nerve enters the supinator muscle so this is an entrapment type of injury and it would be graded as type 1 that is neuropraxia. The symptoms of radial tunnel syndrome is pain at lateral aspect of the elbow, pain may radiate to dorsal forearm and wrist, pain increases with activity and decreases with rest, pain is frequent after heavy manual work mainly activating the supinator muscle. Nocturnal pain is common, there is no sensory involvement that is the posterior compartment, the forearm and the uh, sensory supply to the skin by the radial nerve is not involved because superficial sensory branch is not involved in this condition. There will be motor disturbances that is mostly weakness of the wrist extensors. Resisted supination or wrist extension may aggravate pain and weakness. If you activate the supinator muscle, it will contract and compress the nerve further. Next type is superficial radial nerve syndrome or entrapment. It is also called as Wartenberg syndrome. The main causes occurs near thumb side of the wrist due to tight watch, scissoring effect by brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus the difference between these two type of entrapment is superficial radial nerve there is sensory involvement in posterior interosseous lesion there is motor involvement but no sensory involvement so brachioradialis reflex is intact for posterior interosseous nerve the extensor carpi radialis is spared pain with palpation at the proximal forearm and with forceful supination are some of the important clinical features of posterior interosseous injury. Superficial radial nerve injury, there is no motor involvement but there is a decreased sensation, paresthesia and tingling in the distribution of the superficial radial nerve. Other clinical features, if it is a higher level injury, then there will be wrist drop because any level of injury above elbow, there will be involvement of the posterior muscles of the forearm. All radial innervated muscles are involved. The triceps and brachioradialis reflexes are decreased. 
Sensation is decreased over the triceps, the posterior part of the forearm and dorsum of the hand.